Now, keep in mind, I am not talking about preparing for a fight. I'm not pre- talking about preparing to work through a problem until the horse gives in. I'm talking about making the scenario, the training session, the environment, everything set up in such a way that the horse wins right away. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Willing Equine Podcast. We are recording this in my car during my commutes to and from my work, so the audio may not be super clear, and also my daughter is with me in the car, so you may hear her little comments throughout the podcast. But otherwise, hopefully you can enjoy this podcast and we can discuss all sorts of interesting topics that have to do with making a positive impact on your relationship with your horse. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Benjamin Franklin. I read this quote actually on a non-horse related thing. I was uh, working through my journal. I have like a, a it's a journal slash day timer slash uh, uh, like goal task planner and organizer and is there's a quote on every single page and it's all about mo- it's all motivational stuff to keep you focused and and uh on your goals and dreams and all of that anyway so I saw that quote up in the upper right hand corner and I said that's for horse training too by failing to prepare I I know time and time and time again that that often results in preparing to fail that without taking the time to prepare the horse to prepare myself to prepare the training situation to prepare um, the environment to prepare everything that is necessary for a successful training environment or a successful training session and not just a successful training session but any interaction with our horses by not preparing adequately and then um that we are setting ourselves up for failure. Now, there are different ways of looking at this, different forms of preparing your horse. Um, We can go really short term, really long term. We can go broad scope, short, I mean, small scope. It really depends on what we're looking at, but I'm gonna walk through a couple of areas that are necessary to prepare when we're working with our horses. Now, keep in mind, I am not talking about preparing for a fight. I'm not talking about preparing to work through a problem until the horse gives in. I'm talking about making the scenario, the training session, the environment, everything set up in such a way that the horse wins right away. That the horse is a, a, that hears yeses, hears a yes right away. Here's a yes a few seconds later. I mean, it's just back to back. Yes. That's what I consider success and in a training environment with the horse. I want my horse to know that they are doing right 99.99% of the time. If my horse is not hearing yes from me constantly, then I have not set the horse up for success and I have not set up the training scenario in the training environment correctly for that individual. So let's look at the different types of preparation we can do for training. There's going to be the broad scope type preparation in that if you have a horse that we know struggles to be, let's say, Uh, led out of its stall but we want today to we today we just show up and we're like today we're going on a walk okay well your horse doesn't know how to walk on a lead rope without losing it without being very stressed without being overexcited or without being um fearful whatever it is whatever the the be, it's a set of behaviors that occur when the horse leaves that stall and walks on a lead rope. Whatever happens during that situation, that setup, we know that the horse is not prepared for the goal that we have in mind. We have asked for way too much from that horse all of a sudden. So we have failed to prepare by 
expecting too much from our horse too quickly, having unrealistic expectations of them and what they're able to accomplish and to hear for, and to be hearing that yes from us. We have set them up to be hearing a constant nose and to be getting um, anxious and frustrated and upset. And for us too, we will become anxious and frustrated and upset because we can't make this situation work and we just want them to just get over it and deal with it. But we put them in that situation. We failed to prepare that horse for the particular goal that we had in mind and therefore it failed. (laughs) The whole training session completely failed. The expectation that we had of that horse was set up for failure. Okay, let's go even broader scope on this. How can we prepare even further? Let's say your horse does lead on a lead rope beautifully most of the time, but it's a little bit, there's some days where it's a little bit here and there, or just a little bit touch and go as far as are they in control of themselves? Are they in a calm state of mind? Is everything going to be relaxed? Is this going to be a safe experience? Most of the time that answer is yes, but sometimes things are a little bit off. What happens during those sometimes? What What is it that changes those individual times to create that iffy behavior? So a behavior that is solid in scenario A is a little bit wishy-washy in scenario B. Now we need to look at what are the environmental factors? Are you perhaps stressed or not on your best day? Did the horse's companion just leave the barn? And so he's been in the stall by himself without his companions for a while. And this is a very stressful experience for him. And he's already in a high, uh, high, uh, he's already in a state of being highly stressed. And then we ask him to calmly lead on a lead rope. Or is it maybe feeding time? Or are they maybe... Um, maybe they had a medical change that, like some, physically, like maybe they are having um, some ulcers starting to develop or there's a whole uh, set of possible possibilities for that. But this is another area where preparing beforehand, knowing your horse, knowing what to, um, what is going to make this in this training session or this behavior you'd like the horse to perform to be as successful as possible, what's going to make it make it or break it is part of the preparing process. I know that if I go to lead this horse that is most of the time pretty good but has some separation anxiety and the companion just left the barn, that is probably not a good time to try and lead this horse around. Or there's some other things I could do. I could bring out some extra, extra, extra uh, valuable food rewards. I could possibly bring that companion back into the barn to lead with my horse. I could, um, there's a, there's a variety of things I could do to help this horse be more successful in the training session to go according to plan. So we are preparing to be successful and we're planning ahead of time. So then we have other areas of planning which might be ourselves. Where What are we coming to the training scenario with, the training session with? Are we frazzled? Is our brain all over the place? Have we we're like, well, I kind of want to lead my horse or take him on a walk. And I kind of want to go over here, but I'm not really sure. We'll just see where it goes. While I applaud the, the, that when people are able to kind of let go of expectations and I fully support letting go of expectations, this might be a step too far. We have just totally thrown all planning to the wind and we are just kind of flying by the seat of our pants and we're not setting ourselves up for success here. We're just kind of going to wing it and just do whatever kind of comes in the moment. But by not being able, by not having that plan, that setup where we say, okay, today I'd like to take my horse on a walk. We're going to see how it, we're going to see what the horse, what state of mind they're in. And if it's a good idea to do it this day. But my plan is, or plan A, we should say, is to take him on a walk. We're going to go about this far and we're going to spend some time grazing there and then we're going to walk back. I plan to have this much food rewards, this many food rewards, 
this type of food rewards. I plan to walk about this pace. We're going to practice head down uh, periodically throughout the walk, you know, maybe four or five times. We're going to also practice halting on cue and we're going to do that probably two or three different times. I, if I find that he's getting more anxious, then we'll practice it maybe um, double that amount of times. We'll have to play, we'll play that by ear a little bit, but this is my plan of what I'd like to accomplish today. And we are going to allow flexibility in the plan. Um, and then we might even switch over to plan B, which is if I approach him in his stall and I have all of this planned, but I realize that he is very anxious or not wanting to engage with me today, we will just practice head down and halting on cue in his stall without actually leaving the stall for today. So we have plan A and plan B. And then you could even come up with plan C and, you know, keep going down the chain. And I'm, you can have them be flexible. You can have a flexible plan of, you know, maybe there's the same behaviors we're going to be working on, but a different environment in plan B versus plan A, which would be completely acceptable and allow the horse to communicate when they are comfortable with something or not. And it's not this rigid, fixed schedule that we have to abide by and we're super goal oriented and not allowing for any kind of feel to the situation. I really want to encourage there to be feel to all training um, sessions and to really listen to your horse and let them tell you what it is that they are ready for today. Maybe they did something else differently yesterday and you kind of thought you would work on it again today, but today for some reason something's off. But this is not the same thing as not planning. We still need to be prepared going into our training sessions of what it is we'd like to look, work on, on and what it is that um, would be helpful for the horse, what the environment looks like, what is going to set that horse up for success, how many times do you want to practice this or that, you know, maybe maybe we change that up a little bit maybe today we don't work on halt on cues because we ended up going with plan b which is where we're working in the stall and the stall's not that big so we'll just work on head down and maybe we'll have a plan b behavior that we work on such as touching a target or um teaching the horse to touch a body part to a target so maybe their eye or their ear or their hind end or something like that for um for husbandry for using, preparing for medical attention and medical care. Um, or maybe we have always in the back of our mind that when we're not going to be able to do something really active that day, that we always have in the back of our head that plan C, let's say, that, that behavior that kind of needs more work, but it's a behavior that's good to stow away for a rainy day, which would be something like picking up feet. Maybe they do pick up their feet really well but not perfect. Or maybe you'd like them to do it on just a verbal cue without a physical, a tactile cue. Or maybe we want to perfect standing on the mat. That's something you can do in a stall. So I hope this makes sense where we want the training sessions to be flexible, but still planned so that we are not wishy-washy and we're not, um, when things start not going quite right or maybe the horse is proceeding along the training process much faster than we were expecting or maybe um, we get confused doing something and we need to we realize that we actually need help trying to figure out how to do this individual behavior but you can't get help right the second you're gonna have to go you know get online or something like that so we need to drop that behavior um, or the sometimes what can happen especially when working with new to positive reinforcement horses where the whole training session kind of seems to be like a runaway train where we start off doing one thing because that's when we went into the training session thinking I'm going to work on picking up their feet and then it just turns into this jumbled free sit shaping session where the horse is like frustrated because they can't figure out what it is you're looking for uh, and what it is that you want because your cues aren't clear and you don't even know what you want it's just this runaway train mess craziness of a training session that just leaves everybody frustrated and confused and just just absolutely like okay that I don't know whether that was a good session or not um 
but I do know that my horse is frustrated right now and that's not good. Which brings me to the next step of planning, the really getting down to those details of looking at the individual behavior. If you're looking at teaching the horse to pick up their leg for hoof cleaning, we need to have a step one, step two, step three, step four. You probably want to plan ahead at least five steps for that individual training session in case you get that far. Even if you don't get that far, that's okay. And really what you need to do is when you are planning on teaching individual behavior, when before you even ever begin teaching picking up the feet, you need to sit down maybe with a pen and paper and write down each individual step that needs to be taken to teach the horse to pick up their leg. But when you go into an individual training session, you'll probably only get through one or two of those steps, but you'll at least have them. You'll have them so that you know this is where we start, this is the next step, this is the next one, this is the next one. Okay, that's a good place to stop for today. And next time, we'll kind of start over, but we may progress a little bit faster and so on and so on. So planning and is critical to reducing frustration for your horse, to ensuring the success of the training session, and to keeping you on track and helping your training session to be as successful as possible and as Um, helping you with your confidence as well, helping you be confident in what it is that you're trying to accomplish, what are the next steps, where are you going from here, what can I do if things stop or are not going according to plan. All of these things really do help the sessions to go at least closer to plan. I always encourage flexibility. I Like I said, plan A, plan B, plan C, And I also encourage my students oftentimes to sit down and look at their goals, their long-term goals, create a set. So we look at the far, far out long-term goals. So we're talking, you know, six months plus, maybe even longer than that, maybe even a couple years. Let's say you have a horse that is not quite ready to be ridden yet and you want to ride one day. I don't know how long that's going to take that individual horse, but that's a long-term goal. So then we break that down into much smaller pieces. You know, your horse needs to be able to have rain cues. It needs to know how to turn left and right. It needs to learn how to stop on cues, start on cue. It needs walk, trot, canter. It's the horse needs to um, be able to walk confidently beside a handler, also with the handler in different areas so that they get used to not having to be led everywhere. We can. Um, we also need to teach the horse how to accept a saddle and a cinch or a girth and a bridle and either a bitless or a bit. We need to teach them that it's okay, it, the tactile cues for uh, or verbal cues for the, all of the necessary riding behaviors like walk, trot, canter, all of those. We also need to, anyway, the list goes on forever, um, especially with wanting to get on and ride. But... So we have that really long-term goal that's out there. and Or that's actually not really that long. It depends on the individual, but you get my point. So we have that long-term goal that's out there. Then we have the broken down things that we need before we're comfortable with or we're confident that this horse is ready for us to get in the saddle. And then we need to break down each of those into the individual training parts. So the pieces that need to be put together so that the horse knows how to do those individual behaviors like turn left when they feel the left rein. We need to break that down how we're going to train that and then we start piecing everything together. Now the point of this was the flexibility. So we when we're working with when I'm working with students and I have their long-term goal in mind, I tell them that I have a a couple of different things that you're working on that is focused towards that long-term goal. So we don't necessarily need to have it be a completely um, step-by-step. It could be we're working on four or five different things at a time, but today, you know, we worked on 
turning to rain cues. And then th- this next day we worked on walk on and woe cues. And then this next day we worked on um, tactile cues, whatever, or introducing the saddle. Those three different things so that when you go to do your training session and you go in there with where you get to the barn with plan A, which is we're going to work on introducing the saddle today. But it's clear that your horse is a little bit more frazzled today. Maybe they're anxious about a buddy leaving. Maybe that's not going to benefit anybody today to introduce something that's potentially a little bit frightening to them. So what's plan B? Plan B is still geared towards that long-term goal, but it's a little bit different. So it's still going to get you down that path. It's still going to get you towards that long-term goal. But it may not be the same thing as plan A. So you don't get stuck and fixated on this one thing that we have to accomplish today. It's a completely different thing. So we're teaching rain cues then. Because rain cues we could do in the stall. And if it's not something that's frightening, we can use a target. Targeting is calming for this horse. We can do something completely different that is still getting us down this path towards that long-term goal, keeping everybody happy and relaxed and everybody feeling successful and hearing those yeses and positive reinforcement for both sides. And you still don't, and you don't feel like you've had to give up on your training plan. You don't feel like this wasn't a successful day just because your plan A didn't work out. Plan B is just as good as plan A, and it still gets you towards that long-term goal. Another area of preparation that is critical to the success of a training session or entering any interaction with our horses is going to be preparing yourself. So we talked a little bit about it, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into that, which is I want to, I want you to really think about what it is that impacts your horse during a training session about you. If we are frazzled and frustrated and easily you know, brought to anger, it's obviously going to really impact our horse. They are very sensitive. And what's that, the sayings, you know, the horses mirror you. And um, we just know, we all know, we all know they're sensitive. They react to the slightest little things. And yet we seem to just blow over the fact that that is, part of that is our interaction with them. Um, There's another kind of saying that goes around, you know, check your emotions at the the arena gate kind of thing like don't bring them into the arena now I am like 50 50 on that saying I think it's yes I think we need to I think for me what that means and what I feel like it should mean is let's bring in positive emotions not being completely black and white not being completely indifferent or robotic almost and just like you know, bam, 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 we're going to get this and this done and, you know, task oriented and goal oriented and super just hands off kind of as far as emotional goes. That's to me, that's not a healthy training situation either. It's a quick way to make robotic horses and possibly even just standoffish horses, even when working with positive reinforcement. Instead, I try and encourage people to go into a training session with a positive outcome look on the session. So whether or not we do plan A, plan B, plan C, or we end up just ditching the training session altogether and just having relationship time, I want myself and my students to go in with a, an error, a, um, an emotional state, a mental state of no matter what my horse, how my horse responds, no matter what we accomplish today, no matter what, how far down that pathway towards our long-term goal we get, this is a positive interaction with my horse. I'm going to make this a positive interaction with my horse and I will make the changes necessary to make it positive. And the emotion so the part of that is recognizing when you've been trigger stacking all day when you have been you know sitting in in traffic or you know you spilled coffee on yourself this morning or your kids were screaming at you before school you know because none of that has ever happened to me before but 
um, when all of those things start adding up and it's just been a terrible morning and then we walk into the stall and we just grab our horse and take him out to the arena we're going to do a training session today and it's going to be positive yeah right that's going to be a positive training scenario I trust me I've tried it doesn't work instead we need to recognize that all of that happened we need to recognize that we're uptight today we need to recognize that stuff's going on that we're just having a tough time or even physical stuff if we're not feeling great today if maybe our knee is killing us or we're just tired or whatever it is we need to pause assess all of that as part of the training session that is part of it it's not just your horse your horse may have this um have the off days and on days or days that we can take them out in the lead rope and days that we can't but you do too. You are the other part of this training session. You are the other partner in this relationship and you are going to have your on days and off days. And when you have an off day, go to plan B or plan C or plan zero Um, or no plan, but not no plan as in, okay, scratch that. You have a plan. This is whole, whole podcast is about having a plan. You have a plan, but that plan may be to do nothing to just sit with your horse and read a book or feed him some carrots. That's okay. That's a plan. It may not sound like one, but it is. It's a plan. It is productive too. Um, Just listen to some of my other podcasts about classical conditioning and um, relationship building. I mean, that, that is productive. Trust me. So recognize that you're human and you have on days and off days and spend time either checking those negative emotions at the gate and those bad things that happened that day, those, those things in your day that happened that just stressed you out. Or if you recognize that you're not going to be able to check those at the gate, change over to plan B or plan Z, C, that was C. You may go all the way down to plan Z. That's okay too, but that's okay. So that's another part of planning for success. And then the last one I have is really, really broad spectrum here, which is that your horse's diet, environment, lifestyle, social interactions, everything, enrichment, all of that play a huge part in the training, in the success of your training. We, the ultimate planning for success, the ultimate just very foundation, the very, very core of where we need to begin with, for planning for success, for planning so that we don't fail, is making sure that our horse's basic needs are completely fill, fulfilled and even above and beyond just the basic needs. They need um, to have interactions with other horses. They need to have companions and social interaction. They need to have a herd that they live with or at least a, um, a, a one companion or two or, you know, do the best you can, but they need social interaction. They also need a diet that isn't just amping them up all day with high sugar and destroying their gut and, and giving them ulcers. So they need a forage based diet that is conducive to the species that is necessary for their well-being. And, you know, you can talk with a nutritionalist or your vet or whoever you want to talk to, but definitely assess your diet, the diet of the horse. And then they need um, movement. They need pastures and, and um, even variable terrain pastures like pa- uh, paddock paradises and, and all of those to get them out and moving, move those joints, move that body and stimulate those feet and stimulate the brain, which is another part, which is the enrichment part, the environmental enrichment, the mental activity. They need to be um, engaging and learning and, and problem solving and seeking and, and searching and um, just engaging and not just sitting isolated in a little box or isolated in a dull paddock all day or pasture, however you want to call it. They need enrichment. All of these things, all of in all of these interactions with other people, with other horses, with other animals, with their environment, with you know their diet, all of that plays a huge part in preparing to be successful. If we can't offer our horses their basic needs and then we just expect them to perform on top of it, how are we, it's just unrealistic. It's bordering on insane to do that to somebody and then say now perform at your top 
at your peak. This is not possible. We've got to give them what they need first and then ask them if they can do something that we would like on top of it and then plan to achieve goals after that point. So we need that basic foundation, that broad scope, basic foundation filled, fulfilled of the species appropriate needs for our horses, the things that they need, the very core look past the what's just done normally look past what your barn just does and just expecting them to know what's best for your horse forget all that forget everything we've always done forget everything that the barn manager tells you I mean don't you know I'm not saying disregard your barn manager but but look for yourself look into it look into what your horse needs look into what horses in general need look into what is going to help set you guys up for success and make your training um, as productive as possible and low stress as possible and to get you guys as far into that long-term goal as possible so again by failing to prepare you're preparing to fail and that is so spot on and it's such a it encompasses encompasses everything about horses and what we do with our horses from making changes to the environment so that they are more successful by making sure that their basic needs are met by looking at ourselves and how we feel and how we're interacting with our horses and what today looks like Um, all the way down to the very 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 immediate do you know the step-by-step of this individual behavior that you're trying to train Do you know how to get from point A to point B with just this one singular behavior? And can you list out those steps? So planning is so important. I can't, obviously I've just spent this whole podcast trying to express how important it is. But I'll leave you on a final note of planning is critical to success. But flexible planning is also necessary for mental health, emotional health, and your, you know, for yourself and for your horse. Thanks so much for listening. If you want to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com, and I have links to my social media accounts like Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. And I also have a really extensive blog as well as resources on there like books and other podcasts and websites that you can check out to find out more information. And probably one of the best resources I have on my website is my FAQ page, which is under the training drop-down menu. And check that out because if you have any questions about how I train or positive reinforcement training in general for horses, the answer is probably there. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and I would love to hear any feedback you have. Perhaps leave a comment or email me. Um, If you have any suggestions for future topics, please send those my way and I look forward to talking with you in the future.